Okay, uh, so yeah, my name is Narek. Uh, this talk is called Seeing Arrows Below the Code. Uh, if you're curious to see the slides or any of the source code, it's all available at that uh, GitHub link, and uh, we can move on. Uh, so yeah, my name is Narek. I'm a senior software engineer at a company called uh, Salesforce back in the uh, United States. Uh, I'm a Scala programmer. I do Scala full-time, and I'm generally known as a functional programming zealot or an advocate, as I like to put it more softly. Um, you can find me on Twitter at uh, that handle. Uh, I've been writing Scala for maybe a little over two years, so I'm pretty new to the language. Um, I have a dark past in a, a language surrounded by a snake. Uh, I used to do Python for a living. Uh, but since coming to Scala, I've been very happy. Um, and I work on an R&D team at Salesforce that uh, delivers machine learned data products uh, to super to supercharge the uh, salesperson's day-to-day -day, uh, work. So we do a lot of data engineering and machine learning uh, research on uh, email activity and meeting activity uh, in the interest of speeding up the sales process. So the motivation for the talk uh, is really the, the center of this Venn diagram, right? So we have Scala and its kind of vast array of language features, and then on the other side we have mathematics, theoretical computer science, uh, type theory, all this other stuff, and category theory, which is kind of the, the thing that we're going to look at today in terms of theory. So pure functional programming lies kind of in the middle of some of Scala's language features and, uh, and, and category theory. Uh, and so we want to understand the disconnections and connections between the underlying structures uh, and some of the implementation details. So the talk is split into three sections. Uh, one is the art of abstraction and composition, where we'll learn to uh, delete details uh, from a specific software problem uh, to expose some more abstract underlying uh, nature. And then we'll look at Scala as a category, uh, and then we'll also look at some code examples where we'll dig deep into a couple different type classes available to us in the uh, CATS uh, functional programming library and, and show how to program with arrows in terms of uh, some, some more categorical type thinking rather than the traditional data-oriented kind of Java data container thinking. Uh, what I hope you'll walk away uh, from the talk with is a little bit of a better understanding of a couple categorical concepts that are used in CATS. Um, the importance of composition in software design, that seems to be a theme at the conference so far, composition, and, uh, and programming in terms of arrows and not values. So some caveats, uh, as, as was mentioned, I don't have a math PhD, I'm not a math, uh, mathematician, so we're just doing kind of informal elementary category theory as it applies to functional programming. Um, we're going to look at some intermediate Scala code. I, I assume most people are familiar with uh, a, a library like CATS or Scala Z, so we're going to go with uh, CATS in this case. Uh, and then the, the views expressed in the talk are my own and not my employer's. So we'll jump right into it. The art of abstraction and composition. So we consider this very simple use case of me at a terminal writing a SQL query to a database. Right? I, I request some employees from a table where the ID matches uh, some uh, criteria, and I get a record back, right? And there's this question mark where, you know, we can kind of count this as like an effecty thing, right? It's a, there's an IO involved, there's a, a many or zero or many values that can come back from the database. What if I turn up the knob on its abstraction a little bit uh, in this? So we can remove the notion of having SQL there, it's just a data store. Uh, we remove me in the terminal, we just say it's a client asking for some data out of a data store depending on some query. Let's turn up the knob to 50%. Uh, now we just have input and output, right? Uh, and the question mark remains because we still have some level of uh, computational effect that's, that's occurring uh, when we do this database access. Uh, if we turn the knob to 75%, we end up with A and B. We remove the notion of input and output. Uh, we can still think of it as such, but we get A and B. Question mark again re remains intact. If we then turn up the knob to 95%, we end up with a Kleisley arrow. We end up with A to MB. So you'll notice that the uh, question mark that was originally kind of shrouding this computation is now represented as this type constructor M, and it's known as a Kleisley arrow. Uh, and it belongs in what's called the Kleisley category. So it's a morphism in the Kleisley category. And, and we're going to come back to Kleisley category. I just wanted to kind of show this up front so that we can kind of work toward it. So if you're wondering, so we just turned the knob to 95%, what happens if we turn the knob to 100% and we obscure all the details in the software? You get object-oriented programming. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, but coming back to, to the theme of the talk, I want to uh, introduce this notion that abstraction and composition are entirely correlated. So when you uh, optimize for abstraction in code, uh, you start blurring out details, you can expose some essential objects and relationships um, that define uh, the problem at hand without any of the kind of cumbersome details that, that are there. And same thing with composition. So, so if you turn up abstraction, you get composition for free. If I start trying to make things more and more composable, I get what falls out, which is a very abstract uh, uh, byproduct. So abstraction leads to composition. Composition leads to abstraction. Uh, so the next section, I want to talk about how to ditch objects for objects and view Scala as a category. Uh, to quote Phil Wadler, he says, objects in the category are not the same as objects in programming. You should object to that kind of object. So what is category theory? Uh, it's been introduced maybe a couple times in the conference so far, but it's just a, it's a branch of abstract mathematics uh, concerned with relationships and composition. Uh, it has its origin in the 1940s where logicians and abstract algebraists were looking to find uh, the similarities between different mathematical models. Uh, and ultimately, it's like the abstractive toolkit that mathematicians use. So like, why, why should we care in programming? Um, it's actually foundational in modern uh, functional programming. If you've heard of the uh, Curry-Howard-Lambeck uh, correspondence, you may have heard of Curry-Howard, but Lambeck is the categorical portion of this that relates um, propositions, uh, so propositional logic with type systems with category theory. So it's actually very, very central in some of the modern concepts. It's, it's core in Haskell, and it's also, uh, like if you've heard of like the bananas paper for recursion schemes or optics and lenses, uh, all of these things have roots in category theory as well. So why should you care as, as like the you know, programmer? Um, and I'm going to answer that question with a question. Does a stand-up comedian need to study or understand philosophy? And I think the short answer for this is probably no. Uh, you can go home and write jokes and go to your local open mic night and tell jokes and, and not think about Hegel or whatever ever again uh, and still get the job done. However, if you study philosophy, you start to uncover some of the underlying uh, basics of human interaction or the human struggle, and you can probably come up with more interesting jokes. Um, and, and so that's kind of the, the metaphor that I want to apply to programmers uh, understanding category theory. It's not just a thing that people talk about to sound smart in, in functional programming conferences. It's, it is a very useful uh, field of mathematics. Um, and, and so an elementary understanding of categories goes a long way in functional programming, namely in being able to understand advanced tools. Uh, like cats or monocle or doobie or drosta, uh, there's a lot of these. Um, we also want to be able to leverage, leverage abstractions to write composable code. And well, if you happen to be writing the Haskell later, uh, it also really, really helps once you start reading uh, some of Haskell's source code and also uh, in the documentation. There's a lot of just kind of unashamed uh, categorical type of language there. So the basics of a category, I'll go over this uh, somewhat quickly. You just have objects. Uh, the A and the B and the C, as we see here. Uh, and you have arrows between those objects representing relationships. And anywhere where I have a path from one object to another through a couple arrows, I can compose those two arrows to create a new one. So we have this G compose F that represents uh, G happening after F. Uh, there's also an identity arrow, which people tend to omit. That's just an arrow going from each object to itself. Um, to, to put it in Steve Audi's words, uh, anywhere that functions are, there are categories, and in fact, the subject might better have been called abstract function theory, or perhaps even better, archery, and that's really the t topic of the, uh, the talk here. So if we look at uh, Scala as a category, there's actually two categorical versions of, of Scala. One is with types, one is with inheritance. We're going to focus on types today. Uh, the types are objects, not JVM objects. They're not blobs of memory. They're just types. Uh, the morphisms are uh, functions, so we treat functions as arrows interchangeably. And then we have the identity and composition features that Scala provides at the function level. So if we look uh, at how CATS defines category as a type class, uh, you see that it's some trait abstracted over a uh, higher kind of type of two parameters, and it defines an identity and a composition, right, where the composition takes some f with b and c, and then some f from a and b, and then you end up with this a and c. So it looks very familiar. However, the, the important thing to notice here is that uh, we're, we're talking about a type constructor of two parameters, which can really only be an arrow. Uh, it's, so, so the perspective of category theory in the functional programming realm is that of the arrow. Like we, we need to think about the arrow to understand maybe some of the diagrams that come uh, with the mathy side of things. 
Uh, and to quickly just run over a couple other bits of encoding in Scala that maybe trip up uh, people that are new to the language. We've seen that types are objects, functions are arrows. Uh, type classes are a way to represent categorical structures. And implicit traits, or rather in instances of traits that are implicit, are theorems that, that a said data structure uh, corresponds with the, the categorical uh, structure that we want to uh, show. And then tests and laws, of course, are proof that that theorem holds. So there's a non-trivial distance between uh, the pure mathematical construct uh, that we're talking about and its language encoding. And a lot of the time, Scala's language features get in the way. Uh, and, and we've seen this like with, uh, with implicits and, and some of the, the implementation details of how these libraries are defined. Uh, we're just leveraging invented language features in Scala to be able to, to develop kind of uh, category adjacent code. Uh, it's not really supported in the language first class. But if we focus on the arrows, we can cut through some of the noise and that's really what I want to get into. So arrows everywhere and how to see them. Um, I'm going to go into the shortest section of the talk, functions. The function is an arrow, OK? Uh, Scala composes functions. We have function one compose and and then. They're just flips of one and the other. Uh, and there's some more exotic instances of function that exist in cats as well. Uh, but the basic notion is that, well, if I have an arrow from A to B, and I have some other arrow where the type lines up either on the tip end or the tail end, I can compose them together arbitrarily. And that concludes the shortest section of the talk. <laughs> Let's get into functors. Um, functors are structure-preserving transformations in category theory, and, and I think there's a distance between how Scala encodes them and, and how they are in math. Uh, so we'll look at a very basic code example. Like This, is, this should be a, a simple one. Uh, you have some function, get person, that takes a name, like a string, and you know, through some database magic, returns an optional person from the database. And then we have some function person feature that takes a person, returns a feature, uh, that does a transformation, right? This is very, very straightforward. We just want to be able to compose them together to deliver this uh, function that goes from string to feature, right? So all you do is you call get person with this, some string, you map person feature over it, now all of a sudden you have a function that does uh, the thing that you want. What's the big deal, right? Uh, the, the map operation is, is often taught as like mapping a function over a container. But in categorical terms, the functor is not a container, it's, a, it's an arrow. It's a composable arrow at that, and we'll show why this is the case. So if we define functor in two different places, we can look first at the CATS documentation, where they say it's a type class that abstracts over type constructors that can be mapped over. Um, that's fine. That's actually entirely perfect and, and concrete for the programming use case. But in the textbook, they actually just call functor the same way that they would call a normal function. It's a, f it's a function from C to D where C and D are categories and you're mapping objects to objects and arrows to arrows. <coughs> so we've seen this before in the conference so far. The, the functor type class, it defines this thing called map. I think everybody's familiar with this. But in category theory, this diagram is really what explains uh, what's happening. So you have some category on the left. It looks similar to the ones we looked at before, A, B, and C, with some composition and some arrows. You have F, which is a function at the category level that maps to a new category D, where everything has the F applied to it, right? So I've showed this in type constructor syntax. The category theorist would just show, I think, F, A, or A underscore F. Uh, and so what's important here to think about is that all of the arrows as well are being lifted up into F. So F is being applied to both the arrows and the composition and the identity. So what I really care about in this case, since we're talking about programming with arrows, is lift, which is derived off of map. Uh, and what lift does is it takes a, a value level function from A to B, uh, and it lifts it up to be able to act on F of A's and F of B's. Okay? So it's just a derivative of map. Uh, so if we were to rewrite the same example uh, in terms of only using arrows, we would just call get person and then do a tip to tail uh, composition with functor option lift person feature, which means take person feature, lift it up into the option uh, functor essentially, uh, or use the functor of option to, to lift it up, and then compose it tip to tail with the original get person function. Um, the, the notion here to, to really explore is, is the fact that the uh, arrow is being lifted up, right? So we have this person-to-person -person feature. We're lifting it up into option, and now we can freely compose it with any arrow going to option. Is this necessary, though? Like, uh, the first example actually seemed simpler, right? Um, 
No, it's not, it's not necessary. Like, you don't have to do this. But it, it exposes the important idea that we don't always have to think about acting on values, and we can kind of program in this point-free style where we can just take functions and chain them together. And so Lyft allows us to get that done. And functional programming really is a job of connecting arrows together, and we'll continue to see that throughout the course of the talk. So another example with functor is just, if, what if we introduce a new effect to, to the chain, right? So we want to get, get people rather than just get person. You have a list of names. You want to map them uh, onto the database call uh, and, and get a list of uh, optional people back, right? Can we implement like a get and featureize function uh, using the same primitives that we defined earlier um, in the first example? So we want list of string to list of option of p feature. Can we do this without touching any values? The answer is yes. So all we have to do at this point is compose the two functor instances of list and option. So we do functor list, compose functor option, and then lift the person feature function to, to, to work on both uh, a nested uh, list option uh, type constructor. And what we do net then to implement the thing that we want is just, to, again, tip to tail, arrow composition, get people, and then people features, right? So now we've, we've uh, successfully implemented the type, uh, uh, the function type that we wanted to get. And we haven't touched any values. Uh, the way that this works is, uh, again, the arrow is being uh, modified by the functor. In this case, the functor is g compose f, which means whenever I have a, a function f, I can get a g of uh, f of f for free, right? So I, I can automatically lift into you know, many essentially unbounded layers of effects uh, to be able to uh, avoid having to do nested map calls, which maybe would be the normal way to think about this. Sorry, okay. Uh, and so again, if we, if we blur the lines on this, uh, the, the idea is that the, the functor is just a function in the category of categories. Uh, so functors can compose arbitrarily just like uh, they do, like normal functions do, right? If you have categories C, D, and E, you have uh, arrows from F, uh, F and G, you can compose them to get from C to E. Uh, and so again, like abstraction leads to composition, composition leads to abstraction. What we've done is we've leveraged a very uh, kind of uh, abstract notion of, of chaining these functor arrows together to be able to get composition. And we've avoided this uh, use of uh, map, like nested map calls to, to get it done. So another thing that I want to talk about before we exit the functor section of the talk is that function is a functor as well, even though it's uh, uh, parameterized on, on two types. Uh, so if you bind a type to the left side of function, you end up with a covariant functor on the right side. So what that equates to is I can actually call map on a function to be able to effectively do and then type of uh, semantics, right? So it, it corresponds directly to and then at the function level. Now I'm just treating function as a functor, and I can do covariant mapping on one end, and I can also do contravariant mapping on the other end if I do the converse, right? So if I say I'm binding a type to the right side of function, and I have a hole on the left side, I can now do contramap on that function, right? And so that's kind of displayed here. It's the same thing as composition, but it's also being treated as a functor in this case, so you can chain these functions together uh, essentially arbitrarily as long as the types line up. So the third example kind of leverages this, this, uh, this bit of information. Uh, we're using what's called dimap, which is defined on the pro functor in cats. Uh, so I have my original get people function that takes a list of strings and returns a list of people. Um, I'm uh, essentially doing a contra map of get people on the people features arrow, and then I'm doing an additional covariant mapping of map filter, which just kind of collapses all the options underneath the list. So you have this A to B, R to A, B to C type of composition. That's all done in a single line using the pro functor. So the, the next thing that I want to get to is what I alluded to in the beginning of the talk, which is Kleisley. So it's the, uh, it's the arrow that allows us to sequence computational effects. So in the Kleisley example, we have, like, say, some nested data structure, server conf, has a host in it, an IP, and a server type. The server type is app or microservice, right? These are, let's just pretend these are like Java config objects. Um, and then you have app, which contains a name and some configuration. It's just a bag of strings. Uh, and then you have microservice, which has a name and a locale, okay? So this is like a very nasty nested object. You would probably solve this with optics in most cases. And what we're going to do is essentially derive like a poor man's optics using the Kleisley arrow. Uh, so what we want to focus on is the fact that there's an app conf uh, in the app uh, case class, and then there's a locale in the microservice. We want to extract a locale from both of these things and then be able to extract a region from that locale. Uh, so we build a config extractor for region. It has no guarantees about fields being there. 
and we have multiple levels of option available to us, right? Um, and there's a different substructure underneath, like uh, app and microservice that uh, we'll deal with. So we want extract region from server conf all the way down to option of string. Uh, so I have a getter for the server type field that says, you know, given some server conf, uh, lift the server type uh, field into option. This is to get around the Java nullability. And then we have a function that pulls the locale of a server, so given some server type, we pattern match on left and right, we have an app and a microservice here, and then app.conf, uh, we, we, we call the map get on locale, and then in the other case, we just put locale in an option, so we have, again, two Kleisley arrows, right? And then so what we can do to, to implement the uh, region extractor, we just have a regex that will optionally find the first of you know, North America, US, Asia Pacific, whatever, um, some arbitrary regex that gets our region. Um, and if we want to compose it all together, we can just do this all by lifting these functions into Kleisley. So Kleisley is parameterized on a, a functor f or a monad f. It, it kind of has varying levels of uh, strength that you can use. Uh, and then we have our input type server conf and an output type string. We lift Kleisley into, uh, sorry, we, we lift get server type into Kleisley. Uh, and then we chain it with get locale. And then we chain it again with get region. And what this little fish operator thing is, is just tip to tail composition, but it uses kind of the magic of flat map to be able to uh, get this done. And so if we want to implement the original function that we wanted, we just use the Kleisley and call run. It exposes the underlying arrow uh, that's there. Kleisley is a case class, so that's uh, why we have to do this. So why build this way, right? Again, like, do you have to do this? Probably not. Like, you don't necessarily have to do it this way. Again, Monocle has an optic called optional that you can use that'll allow you to do this automatically. Um, but we can, uh, so the fact that we can uh, accomplish this by chaining a bunch of flat maps together is fine, but that makes us think about the cumbersome uh, values at hand, right? We want to just be able to have a, a modular pipeline where we can uh, drop in and take out different functions and, and build this kind of uh, from scratch, right? So if I wanted to implement like get language, it's also some function from string to option to string. We implement a different regex, and now we can easily create a new extractor for languages just chaining together the kind of cheap optics that we've uh, derived so far. So arrows, like arrow programming yields composability and modularity in a way that maybe value programming and data, data container type programming does not. Uh, because you never have to think about values, you just think about the, you know, what's on the end of the arrow. Uh, and so if this looks familiar, again, this is all A to MB type of arrows. Everything follows this shape and Kleisley allows us to, to compose these. Um, so again, if we, we look at the definitions and contrast between the cat's docs and the textbook, uh, cat's docs will just say that Kleisley enables composition of functions that return a monadic value. If the f provided has a flat math instance, you can compose two Kleisleys together as if we were composing two functions, okay? The textbook definition is a little bit more involved. Uh, <laughs> this is quoted in, in like extractive way from uh, Steve Audi's textbook. It's given a monad t, rho, and mu, where t is a, t is a, uh, a functor effectively, the functor that has an adjunction. Uh, and a row, which is the uh, unit, which is like the, the constructor for a, um, a monad, and a, and a mu, which is like flattening operation, uh, you can get a Kleisley category. So I'm going to kind of skip over this stuff, but just talk about the fact that uh, because we have a functor, we, we're creating this new category that has all of these A's and B's and C's uh, in some context. And the most important part is this. In composition, given some function from AT to AB, and some G uh, from B to C, like both in the T kind of monadic context, the, comp the composite G compose F is defined as mu compose TG compose F. What this really translates to is this just means map G on the existing F function and then flatten the result, right? And we can see this a little bit more clearly uh, when you look at it in like a categorical diagram. So in the Kleisley category, what you have, and, and I've translated this a little bit into Scala terms, but if you start with this A and you have this monadic kind of function F, it gets you to MB. Right? And if you want to be able to compose it with G, you have to map the G on, on M of B to get this M of M of C, and you have your mu operation flatten that makes the diagram commute and finally gives us this composition arrow from A to MC, which is kind of the Kleisley composition of those two arrows. And we can kind of corrupt this a little bit and simplify it and take away the flattening step and just say A goes to MB, MB goes to MC, and then we finally have this arrow from A to MC. We just kind of hide a little bit of the uh, kind of technical cruft that's there to make this work. 
Right, and so the compose operator in this case is Claisley composition, uh, like that arrow thing that we saw, and you can also flip it and do it backwards if you wanted to as well. It's, it's totally up to you. Um, I, I like the kind of forward-looking and then type of composition myself. And so a quick recap uh, to, to close out the talk, uh, and we can open up questions if we want. Uh, what we haven't seen so far is burritos, boxes, pipes, any of these like weird analogies. We're just thinking purely in terms of arrows. Um, and the, the value-centric type of programming style that's like really present in a lot of, I think, tutorials about this type of uh, subject matter is, is not present at all here as well. We're really just thinking about arrows and categories. And we've also kind of not hidden from math terminology as well. But what we have seen, what we have seen so far is you know, three types of composition, right? Plain old function composition, which we're all familiar with. Functor arrow composition using lift, and we've also seen functor composition to provide new types of lifts, right? So like these composed nested lifts. And then we've also seen monadic composition, like sequencing of, of uh, Claisley arrows using the Claisley data type that's available in CATS. Um, what we've also seen is that if we focus on uh, relationships between objects, we can really compose functions from functions, and that's really the basis of arrow-based programming. It's the idea of, I don't want to touch values. I don't care. I have functions that do certain things, and I want to be able to compose new programs by connecting them together in, in uh, uh, new ways. Uh, so it's a highly modular approach to programming, like I said before. Um, and so there's, we've also seen that there's a subset of Scala that allows us to write functional code uh, closer to these kind of diagrams that I've been showing throughout the course of the talk. Um, and the arrow is the key to this if we want to implement this in Scala. So, and, and the last thing that I really want to uh, stand on is because this style of programming, which I think they call it like uh, point-free programming in Haskell, uh, it can be fun and useful, and it's not pointless. Like, it's actually, uh, if you're working in, like, domains where you're using parsers or you're doing data transformations, the point-free style is not pointless. It's actually very useful, and it removes a lot of the cruft when you stop thinking about values. Uh, a couple acknowledgments. I just wanted to thank my team at Salesforce for supporting me, and as well as Cody Allen, uh, who helped give a bunch of feedback and shape the presentation. Uh, and also thanks to the folks at FP Chat, uh, Slack Group, and the CATS folks in Gitter for enduring my often stupid questions. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, there's a few sources that I've listed here uh, that are super interesting and that I referenced a couple times, namely the Steve Audi Category Theory textbook and the uh, Categorical View of Computational Effects by Emily Real, which is an excellent uh, conference talk. Um, and so, thank you, and I'll open it up to questions if we have, still have time. Yeah? I must have done a good job then. <laughs> Is there anything that anybody wants me to go back to? I'm happy to do that if, uh, if there's any time or if there's anything that needs clarification. Okay. All right. Thank you.